Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining us today. We are having a panel discussion with three amazing people who are all involved in the world of film, music, composing for film, and in some cases, games. This is in honor of Sound Toys Sound Design Week. We're going to be talking to three people who, are, although they're not technically sound designers, are definitely designing new and interesting sounds as part of their work in scoring music for picture. We've got Dan Deacon with us from Baltimore, Maryland. How are you doing, Dan? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you with us. In case you're not familiar with him, Dan Deacon is a solo artist in his own right, a really distinctive electronic musician, but he's also been working in the world of film scores. Notably, he did his first score ever with Francis Ford Coppola, which is pretty amazing. And he's been working in that world more and more in recent years. Recently, he's worked on the new Adam Sandler picture, Hustle, for Netflix. He's done work with the New York City Ballet and a whole bunch more. So really eager to talk to him. We also have with us Ryan Miller. You may know him from the band Guster. Excellent band, if you're not familiar with them. And he has been working on an increasing number of film scores lately. Notably, Something from Tiffany's was a major score that he did that's uh, streaming on Amazon. Ryan, thanks for joining us from Vermont. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. We got it happening. We're all here. We made it happen. I'm so excited. Yes, man. You have like an army of synths there. We're going to have to ask about toys are, and stuff that you guys like all, to use in the studio. They're all like M audio controllers I bought at garage sales for like $9. They generate no Don't sounds. Tell anybody. The keep the mystique. <laughs> <laughs> and also joining us from LA, we got Jason LaRocca, who's going to bring a different perspective from it. He's not really a composer himself, although he was in a really cool punk band back in the day called The Briggs, who you've probably heard, even if you don't know it. He is now really on the engineering side. And in addition to working on you know traditional music production projects, he's done a whole bunch of film scores for a whole huge swath of major movie releases, including Aquaman, God of War, Morbius, Unbearable, Weight of Massive Talent. He's worked on the game Fortnite, the new streaming series on Amazon, Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, and a whole bunch more. More. So welcome, Jason. Thanks for being with us. Stoked to be here and chat. Let's do this. Good stuff. As mentioned, this one is brought to you by Sound Toys. Big thanks to them for sponsoring this video, making it happen. They make some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. And if you're catching this video when it comes out, they right now have a sale going on. And the theme of that sale is sound design and music for pictures. So really great fit. Big thanks to those guys. And I know all three of our panelists today are big lovers of these tools. In addition to many things around the business of doing sound for picture, the approach and creative approaches to making better, more interesting scores. We'll also ask them about their top three favorite sound toys plugins. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's jump right into it. I want to get one thing out of the way, which is sound design. None of you are like strictly sound designers. You're not making like the T-Rex sounds for, you know, Jurassic Park number 385, but you guys are creating your own library of sounds to work from. And that's one of the things we want to talk about is getting, getting sounds, getting textures, and also just your process and approach to film scores and game scores where applicable and how that's different than regular music production. So let's just get right into that with Dan. Question for you. You've been doing film score stuff for years now. I think your first thing was with Francis Ford Culpa, and you've been doing more and more of them in recent years. Can you give us a sense for what your approach is like as a film composer, someone who's doing scores compared to your approach as just an independent artist of your own? Sure. It's a pretty different skill set in my mind. And like, because like when I'm writing my own music, it's in theory, the only thing. Do you know what I mean? In reality, it's like what people listen to while they drive or do the dishes or jog. So it's really not the focal point. It's still background music. Like I think most music in the 21st century is furniture music, if that makes any sense. But film music, you know, no one's going to the movie to be like, oh, I, I really hope there's some solid cues in this. I hope the picture doesn't distract me from this beautiful music. <laughs> so when I'm writing my own music, as particularly like, you know, I got into electronic music because of you know, timbral sculpting and, you know, timbral synthesis. That's like, I think, why a lot of people are driven to either the studio or to electronic music. Like, it's fun to be in a band. It's fun to pick up an instrument and play it. But there's a different pleasure in taking a sound and doing something with it. It's a very different experience. Like, the same way that, like, composition is different from mixing, you just get a different pleasure out of it, I think. Film, I try to remember that it's a part of something else. So, you know, if I get the script or if I get like dailies or a rough cut, I try to watch it down and not let the temp have too large of a role. Like if anyone's not familiar, temp music is the music of the editor is already placed. 
so that um, they just have something to cut to. And there can be a lot of temp love and people can fall in love with that and that can really steer you in the wrong direction because no one hears music the same way. They might be latching onto it because of the bass, but you might be hearing the drums or like that tick, 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 tick sort of sound. So I try to just remove the temp as early as possible. It's kind of like starting a new relationship. You don't want to start it and be like, do you have any of your ex's clothes? Like, what were your favorite like nicknames they had for you? Like, let's do it. Like, <laughs> like you don't want to enter a film that way. So I just try to think about what does this film sound like? like? And sometimes directors will come in with a big playlist or they'll come in with ideas and that's great. And other times they come in without that and that's also great. And I try to think about like, what are the macro sounds? What if it's going to have acoustic elements? What's the instrumentation going to be? How far can we push that into the realm of electroacoustic music? If it's all synthetic, does it need to sound real? Does it need to be like a synth that sounds expressive or is it deliberately not? Do you know what I mean? So just trying to think about where it sits, how it's going to sit with the sound design. If it's a sound design heavy film, I need to make sure that it's not masking each other. They're not competing or else it's just going to be a competition to see how quiet you can make something. If that makes any sense. So uh, I'm really rambling and I don't know how to stop talking. So um, what Actually, do you think, Justin? Well, right, right. I, think <laughs> some, I think some great insights there. And I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, Ryan, you come from a, a somewhat similar background, if you can relate to some of that. But what are some of the big distinctions for you between working in your band and creating your own music that way and then making sound for other people's pictures? Um, well, I don't relate to any of that. I just think that's awesome. <laughs> I wish that I had talked to you like 12 years ago. I feel like I'm just now like, I think I'm working on my like 15th feature right now. And I'm just now getting to what Dan's talking about. Like, I think, I mean, I just, I don't, I never, I never came from the place of Sodic stuff. I, I didn't come up as an engineer. I didn't come up as a mixer. I had made all these records and have continued to make records with like fancy studios and fancy producers and like never cared about compression or EQ and was like, you know, and being like Bearsville or the record plant and be like, oh, what's a fair child? I don't care. Like what's for lunch? Um, this is something I've sort of, I've been the accidental engineer. Like I just, I just come from the much more compositional thing. I, I came as a songwriter. I came as a, as a singer and a, and a melody person. So, I mean, I, I, I really respect Dan's uh, approach and I would, and I want to, I'd like to hear him talk forever about it. I mean, it's completely <laughs> different than how I approach film scores and um, probably to my detriment. And like, I'm a, I'm a big melody guy. So I'm always kind of trying to like, get themes in and okay here's a theme and how can we twist it like okay in this moment we're happy like okay at this point it's dark can we make it minor can we can we change the textures a little bit can we kind of spread it out so i i come i at least that's like what i was trying to do at the beginning of the thing is like i try and have themes that mutate and try and have things that kind of uh textures that come in and out that kind of follow along with the arc of a of a character or of a story so I would guess, uh, Ryan, that maybe building a team is maybe slightly more important for you than it is for Dan if uh, you're really trying to focus so much on themes and creating music that's going to take us through the piece that you might be collaborating with others for things like orchestration or engineering. What kind of team do you have to build to complement your skill set? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I just took on a, a writing partner. So this will be our third film score working together. And it's someone that's like way better at this than me who you know, went to Berkeley and knows how to uh, chart something and knows how to get players like within 15 minutes to redo something. So uh, his name's Jay Lifted and we've just, we're, we're right in the middle of our third score right now. But, uh, you know, I have collaborators that I've had to do remixing and I do a lot of stuff in the box. So I'll, I'll hire a string, you know, I've hired string players for a lot of my scores to kind of do it at the end. So it doesn't sound like a dude in Vermont just pressing buttons on his soft synths. So a lot of that stuff comes later, but it's not really like, it's not what's great about my film scores, I think. It's not like, oh, look at this sonic majesty that is galloping across my screen. Um, but it is something I really appreciate about film com composition and really great composers. Yeah. Now, Jason, you have a really different perspective on this because you're not usually the one writing the stuff and you're collaborating with writers as their kind of engineer who is trying to turn this thing from a collection of nicely recorded themes into a beautiful sounding, impressive final mix. What's the difference between approaching this stuff for film compared to just working on normal music production projects? Well, it's interesting. Like there's, there's sort of a, a, a number of great things that you guys have touched upon, Ryan and Dan, like so many great things that could be covered. One thing that's interesting is that sort of the style of the score, you know, for a film can dictate how much 
somebody like me would get involved in a film. You know, there's there's some film scores that are just a guitar and a vocal, and that's more or less done by the composer, and and it's sort of done. But there's a lot of there's a lot of film scores now that are kind of some stylistically that are very different, very hybrid, you know, hundreds of tracks, sometimes even thousands of tracks of stuff that, you know, the composers writing, trying to get things approved and, and right at the last minute, when we have two weeks before the film is finished, they decide to record everything, but they record everything completely separately. It's brass, it's strings, it's woodwinds, it's choirs, it's vocals. It's like, 25 different soloists recording in all their different respective homes and studios and in a process like that the composer would get completely overwhelmed having to think about okay now i have to put all this together and mix this and my brain is fried i just got the last piece of music approved and i just wrote 120 minutes of music and and, and what do i do and that's usually where i come in the process a lot of the time now in modern film scoring it was like you just got a mass of crap that has to then be put together and quickly and efficiently and then mixed, you know, in, in usually 7.1 or, or even higher sometimes these days. So like, that's where, you know, these days, that's where somebody like me comes in is sort of like at the end of the process. I mean, I've, I've come in at the beginning of the process too, where it's like, you know, I've had, you know, guys who are just doing their first film score and they, they kind of know what to do. Sonically, they're really great, but they don't really understand, like Dan's talking about temp music and things like that. Like these are sort of ins and outs that are more specific to the process of a film that, that a young composer may not understand or know what to do with in terms of, well, how much time do we have? You know, what are we doing? How do we get a director to not fall in love with the temp and fall in love with my music and sort of like holding, you know, his or her hand along in the beginning, trying to find that sound, find that balance between, you know, creativity and making the director and producers happy and, and actually approving the music. There's so many different, like Dan was saying that, you know, the picture is we're working for the picture and for the dialogue, you know? And so as opposed to making a record where we are the focal point, you know, the, the band or the artist is it. And, and that is the focal point versus in a film, there's a lot more of a collaborative thing going on where there's, there's people who their interest is, how do we make these sound effects great? And there's, there's guys on the team who their interest is, how do we make this dialogue sound great? And then there's a music team who is there to sort of support the whole thing underneath. And, and, you know, maybe at times it's a lead sometimes with musicals and stuff like that, but it's usually just supporting a, a sort of a bigger picture as it were to, to use the word. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely a different approach, but at the same time, I come from an album background. So for me, I approach films in sort of like a, I'm very DIY and, and, and kind of just, you know, everything to me is like, well, that's, and that's what I really like about sound toys too, is like, it's very easy to use that stuff. And so for me, you know, I'm not like a super technical guy. So using sound toys plugins for me, is like, I can get a really cool sound and a great tone pretty quickly and easily. And in, and in film music, that's, that's something you kind of speed is a big part of the process. Whereas in making an album, you've got however long you need to make the album make it sound too much good. time <laughs> too much time <laughs> yeah. well let's talk a little bit about textures and sounds because i think that's one of the things that's going to be fun to geek out on especially when we're working with a company like sound toys where they make tools that are so awesome for creating new textures and sounds dan when ryan was talking he was talking a little bit about how much he likes to prioritize writing a really great top line and he's really focused on melody I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm assuming just from your personality that maybe you focus a little bit more on textures first and then melody second, or is it the other way around? What's the approach for developing the sounds that you're going to use in a particular score? How do you settle on what kind of sounds you're going to end up using? And then how do you go and start inventing new types of sounds to appear in a picture? It's definitely texture first. Like I always wish I could just like sit down at an instrument and melodies fall out, but it's like looking for tiny pieces of plastic at the beach for me. It's just like pure tedious hell to find a melody. And I, you know, I, I like doing it, but it is, it is not what comes quick and easy. I like to think of, and this is independent of film scoring, but making music in general, 
the reason why it's my hobby is it's a lot like an artist who takes out a sketchbook and you're just sketching. You know, it's not for anybody else. It's just like a blank page. Who gives a shit? And then when it you you make something that you like, you're like, oh, this is worth saving. Uh, uh, this is worth keeping. I can do something with this. What is it? What's it? What's it going to be? And with film scoring early on, when you most films hopefully have a variety of moods and places you could go. So I like to start in this demo phase where I'm really just making like macro forms and that's they're mostly mood and mood is heavily dictated by, in my mind, by timbre. Maybe it's like the overtones or what, but of course harmony plays a massive role, but I tend to stay away from melody until I know that emo the macro of a motif is there. And this is particularly true, I think, in uh, nonfiction film, where like it's such a malleable picture. Like even after picture lock, there's like I work on some projects that are like picture lock V five to be changed. Like and it's like who's who's what is the lock on your house like? Like what are you doing? This is not locked whatsoever. But that's how it works. Like sometimes I'll be working on a doc and they'll be like, oh, the lead person went to prison last night, and uh, if we don't include that in the film, we might as well not release it. So. Uh, can you write a theme for what's going to happen to them in court in four months from now? So try to, where with narrative, you get a script. It tends to stay pretty close to the script. And that's when I lean a little bit more into writing thematically or like leading with melody first, if that makes any sense. But it's really just picking out, all right, so all right, all right, all right, let's get real, let's get real. Um, <laughs> so I figure out what the sounds are going to be. Like, <laughs> like, uh, who, who is trying to interrupt you right there? Like, <laughs> it's the, the other me in my go. brain being like, shut up, shut up. Um, anyway, so I had a little too I much like coffee. the dad uh, show. I want you to just keep great. going. I'm here for it. I'm just drinking my coffee. I'll just, I'll, let's, let's, I love the sounds, dad show. You clean them up. And then I like to work more and more with improvisers, chopping up sort of like a Brian Eno approach but building more of like sample banks and sample libraries, like finding individual sounds, finding things that would take forever to program in MIDI, expressiveness, individual notes, and then collaging them together into, um, into melodies or into textures or into pads, and then seeing how it fits and laying it in with the rough cut, seeing where the dialogue is, seeing where masking could occur, where you can dip in and out. And I tend to work pretty like left to center style production, so I can get pretty out there and trippy. And that's where, you know, plugins really become fun. I used to never use them until Dan Rome at Sound Toys was like, can we give you one of our plugins to try out? And I was like, I don't know. I don't use plugins. And he's like, what do you mean you don't use plugins? And I was like, because my show used to be like, I guess it still is, the most rickety laptop I had because if it got smashed or destroyed, it didn't matter. Hmm. So I just wanted to run like bare bones stock stuff. And it's more like I didn't want to be like, Tempted. It's like getting offered a first class flight, knowing you'll, I'll never be able to fly first class ever again. I kind of like just didn't want to know. But then as soon as Dan got me like a, like any good like a uh, dealer of narcotics, they knew I was like in for life. So <laughs> from there, like now it's like impossible for me to not throw like decapitator on just for a little saturation on a soft synth just to give it a little life and leaning into things and like having things just like I don't know. And crystallizer is really fun in the opposite respect where like if I know I'm not going to be using synths, but I'm demoing with synths, I can throw a crystallizer on there on its own channel, record that, and then reorchestrate that. So I can have the same like melodies and texture and get the range information. To me, it's all about the idea generation. And like Jason was saying, it's getting as many ideas out of your head and into a file that you can share with a huge group of people that are going to come back and say like, no, no, maybe, no, 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 could be okay, yes, yes, yes. Taking all of those and hundreds of channels and not really mixing them because you trust someone like Jason at the end to really mix them and clean them up and get them in there. Because it is like that. Like when I, I did, Hustle was my first big, like large production with like a full orchestral recording. And I never in my life would have thought like it would have made sense to do exactly what he said, like compose for like six months going from like, the director's perspective, uh, the studio's perspective, and Netflix's perspective, combining all those ideas over a huge period of time, and then in two weeks, fly to London, record it air, send it to LA, mix it in five days, and then it goes to the stage and the whole thing is mixed. Like, it just seems completely and utterly insane. But I couldn't. If I had started with the orchestra, we would have had, like, what, 95 orchestral sessions where we're going through and editing and micro-tweaking and 
the good thing about it, and this is now what producers want to but the good thing is once you're on the stage, then you can really like, you know, what are they going to do? They're already recording. You can't go back and do it again. And then you can like lean in a little bit more, <laughs> lean into those like extended techniques and find, see what the orchestra, the sweetness of it is there. But when you don't have that, that's where plugins come in. When you, when you can go in and find that sweetness yourself, because I don't know if I'll ever get a full orchestral session again. And you have to make these, everyone wants everything to sound as real as possible. And if you don't have to tell them it's fake, most people think it is. I think most people that are outside of audio production aren't thinking there's orchestras in everyone's little box. I don't think they're thinking about it at all. The same way that no one knows that it's like a guy playing the organ at the Rangers games. It's just music, it's there. They're not thinking about how it got made. No one wants to bite into a cake and be like, how does the farmer treat the chickens who lays the eggs? Like, it's just, I wanna eat the cake. So, so I don't know. Does that make any sense? I definitely want to eat the cake. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. There's a subset of people who care about how the, the farmers treat the chickens. However, yeah, most of the time you're not thinking about that while you're eating cake. Uh, Ryan, similar question for you. You are so top line focused. You're really focused on writing melodies and themes being the most important thing. But I'm curious, what comes first for you? Like the sonic palette or the themes? Like, are you coming up with like, here are the voices and the types of instruments and sounds you're going to be using this film. Now let me write themes for them. Or are you starting with themes and then figuring out palette later? How does that break down? I mean, I usually like my my speech with the with with directors is usually like eighty percent of the work is in the first three cues, right? It's like by the first three cues, the first three approved cues, you've got your colors, your textures, and your melodies. So a lot of it is just like those conversations about like what what's our landscape going to be like. So. The last two films, not the one I'm working on now, is with uh, this guy, Daryl Ween. And the first one, he was like super obsessed with John Bryan. So that's a blessing and a curse because I love him as a film composer, but it was all about, you know, mellotrons and harpsichords and vibra, you know, vibraphones. And, and so it was like, well, how can we do this and how can we kind of get out of it? So it was like, we kind of stayed in that palette just because after a while, I kept trying to get out of the box and we kind of kept coming back in. But then on the last one we did, it was a, it was this big rom-com for Amazon, the biggest budget movie I ever worked on. We were going to have access to strings and horns and woodwind players at the end, and he went very Hollywood and big. So we used a lot of soft sense knowing that we were going to go and be able to use real players, and we were we recorded to 45 people at the end. So obviously those, if you're writing a big, slick Hollywood, something that wants to feel big, you're going to approach it in a completely different way than if you're going to do kind of a John Bryan adjacent, quirky, Mellotron, you know, forward kind of thing so yeah i mean textures definitely are a huge part the sandbox that you're playing in is a, is a huge part of all this it's what it's what i like about film scoring it was my big sort of revelation was like i think limitations are one of the great inspirations for creativity and almost the smaller the sandbox the more i enjoy it because sometimes it's just like looking at a blank page like what the f and that's what being in a band is especially our band that's like you know, our bands change a lot in the last 30 something years. Our first record doesn't sound anything like our last record. So it's really, that's what I love about film score. I love that there is a beginning and a middle and end. It's like, okay, she walks in, she's a little bit mad. Okay. But then she pauses and then there's a moment. And then at the end, there's a little bit of a relax. So I love the assignment. I think the smaller I can make the sandbox, the more I feel inspired because I'm like, well, I can erase all this other shit. I just have to make this work within the context of a personality and textures that we've decided and, you know, themes and all that. I don't know if that answers your question, but unfortunately you have, you have two people that kind of can just like recursively feed on their own mouth. So they, you could just ask one question and we end up talking about box cake. You know what I mean? Like, how did I get yeah. here? I don't know. Anyway, did that help? <laughs> You're doing fine, Ryan. You're definitely <laughs> keeping up. So I have a question for you to piggyback on that. You bring up the really specific idea of a, a particular scene that you might compose for. How often are you writing these themes like two picture? Is it happening with literally a scene there and you're scoring two picture or you're just getting the feel for it and they're two separate processes? I love it. Actually, this film that we're doing right now, literally I'm getting notes on my phone as we're, as we're talking about this. My co-composer is like, well, I think we should write a lot of music before we go. And I'm like, I've never done that. I just don't, I like to know because then I don't know. I want to see it. I mean, I only know when I see it. When I put it up against picture, I don't know if it's working. I mean, I... I love, I mean, I got to say, Dan, I love the way, it's actually really inspiring to hear you talk because I'm like, oh, that's a cool way to make music. I want to make music like that, but I don't do it that. Like, I just, I like, I want my assignment and I want to get in there and I want to be able to know if it's going to work. And I know instantly if it's going to work and then I can tweak it against picture. But 
I don't have like an idea about a film and be like, oh, this is this is going to be majestic and it's going to be like winter and, and frozen grass. You know, I just I can't I don't really work that way. I, I love I know people do and I really respect it, but I've never really had success that way. I don't know if it's successful. I don't know if that method is to just throw that out there. I don't know if it does work. <laughs> just because I do it doesn't mean it's right. Uh, Ryan, one last question uh, on there before we move on to get uh, Jason's perspective on this. But when you are creating new sounds out of mostly, I guess, real instruments that you have in the space with you, how much of the sound is coming from the way you're recording it going in versus using crazy effect afterwards on a really plain sound i mean, I'm such a shitty engineer and it's just like it's really a, it's really i'm sorry that you got me for sound toys because i'm the wrong guy although i do this i do i will say that plugins are the thing that i kind of am started to help me a lot like just the idea that you can you could hit a, a, a mug and then that sounds like crap but you pull it through you know the plate right now you know like and all of a sudden it's, it's, it has, it's musical, you know, and you can pull the, you know, the bass multiplier down. And, and so I really found, I do feel like I use um, plugins as, as instruments a lot of times because a source of anything, it's just, it's, it can be garbage. And all of a sudden you do put a crystallizer or some kind of crazy phase on it and it just turns into an instrument. So I've, I, I love that. I love that kind of work. And it, I do find it very inspiring. But I, my, uh, my crate is not that, it's not a deep crate, really. Sure. Now, uh, Jason, same general idea about getting final sounds. You're usually not the one involved in generating the original sounds or even recording them. You're getting like these finished projects and you're tweaking them. How much of the process for you is just rebalancing and mixing, getting the balance right is the most important thing? And how much is alteration of sound and recreation and reimagining the sound is part of the process for you? Well, sometimes it's a collaborative thing where the composer <laughs> will use a sound toys plugin in stereo in their whole demo process. And then when it comes to me to mix it, I'll actually take whatever preset or sound they've started on the sound toys plugin and then make like two or three of them so I can put it in surround. So I'll put like, one echo boy on the front speakers, one echo boy in the side speakers, and then one echo boy in the re in the rear speakers and put them all like a little bit different. There was actually a film, Paddington, where I was working with uh, Nick Urata, the composer, was obsessed with the preset Starlight on Echo Boy. <laughs> it was like basically almost o overly using it, but it was really perfect for that film. And rather than print it, with this the starlight preset on the piano we actually printed it dry and then i put my own surround version of it basically on the piano so like in the writing process it was like wow this is an incredible sound what do you have going on in this like oh, it's just a preset it's just a stock preset on the echo boy so we sort of made that a conscious sort of decision to kind of be like well let's let's sort of use that sound but now let's make it cinematic and make it you know sort of in in surround but there's, you know, honestly, if I had just just sound toys, I could probably mix a score with just sound toys. Sound toys and an EQ, probably. I mean, I'll use Det Decapitator on brass, like on live brass, like all the time. You know, it's a lot of the time, like the brass is, is like, uh, you know, written with samples and the samples sound incredible and they're like big and compressed and like doing this whole thing. And then when you record it, it sounds great. You've got live players and the melodies are all speaking beautifully, but you don't have that like thing where it's just in hitting you in the face you know and um i'll just put decapitator on the room mics i don't care you know maybe it maybe uh you know a purist would would balk at something like that and say that's not the way you treat you know a recording at air or something like that but i've i've had it work and and i think it's great you know what i mean so there's there's just a lot of i i just have you know, plugins all over my, my inserts, like on all my templates. So I've just got stuff kind of already there. So I've got like, you know, my EQs, my compressors, I've got, you know, probably an echo boy on every single, you know, effects return. So I've got like, a, you know, 20 different or 40 different, uh, stems for every single, you know, sound in, in, in the mix. So I've got an echo boy on every return. It's just sort of like, uh, it's easy to use and abuse. I get, like you said, it's kind of like crack, like Dan said, sound crack five. 
Well, while we're on the topic of specific <laughs> plugins and sound toys, I think this is now is a good opportunity to give them a little bit of a shout out and I uh, want to do a little bit of a lightning round here. So we're going to go in reverse order this time. All three of you, like what? Thank God. Going first has sucked, by the way. So I'm clever going in reverse. <laughs> all right. Well, we're, we're mixing it up. So uh, all three of you, three top favorite sound toys plugins that you use the most often in film score stuff and why. So, Jason, starting with you this time, you already got a free one with Decapitator. You pretty much gave us the answer on that. Yeah, one. Decapitator's not a devil lock. You know, I'll use devil lock all the time. I, and even just subtly. I know it's a super extreme plugin, but a little bit of it, to me, goes a long way on almost everything. Just so that you start to pull up that. I like to hear noise floor or at least whatever sort of there in subtle recordings. I like to bring that shit up. I like to hear that stuff just kind of. I want to hear everything. So I'll use a little bit of that on on everything, on every, you know, basses, drums. I'll put it sometimes on strings, you know, which is kind of a little bit of an odd, unorthodox place to use it. But Echo Boy is on everything it's too. It's smash and more to bring up details. So do you be doing that in parallel or are you doing it by just using Well, small that's what I love about the fact that it has a mix knob because I'm, I'm lazy. I'm a very lazy mixer. So I don't want to sit there and duplicate a channel and then, you know, do a parallel mix of something with like the extreme settings, but just mixed in with the fader up a little bit. I like to just put the plug in on, put it at 3% or, you know, 10% and and then just move on to the next sound. I don't have time to create parallel tracks and all that stuff. So I, I always just put a little bit of mix in there. Mix it. I also just what? don't trust. I don't trust the parallel channels to make it. Um, oh, there's a delay. I'm sorry. No, I don't yeah. trust the parallel channels to make it into the mix. Like if I'm handing my files off to someone I've had one conversation with over Zoom and they see that I have all these parallel channels and I just imagine those being like, okay, goodbye, parallel goodbye. compression. It's, You're it's goodbye. completely you just, gone. No, yeah. I, as, soon as, as soon as that, because the devil lock, whatever it was, the, the junior or the, the small version that came out didn't right. have the mix knob. And I was like, oh, this is a great plugin, but it's like, there's no mix knob. And then when it had the mix knob, I was like, okay, this is going on everything. Because that's exactly what I need. I want to be able to move quick and just go, okay, that sounds cool, but I only want a little bit of it. And that's, you know, park it. You know what I mean? I, I love how much like it turns out that the kids are right because you. Re I remember like back in the day when in the box mixing was becoming a thing, there were so many things that big wig producers and engineers are supposed to tell the kids about how they're doing it wrong inside their DAW. And you're not just allowed to throw a plug in and everything and use the mix knob. You're supposed to set up aux ends. But, you know, here we are a decade or two later. It's like, no, no, the kids were right. This is fast. This is easy. Well, this remember works, back in the day in Pro Tools, there was like a plug in that you had to put on every channel that like compensated for them all. And then there was like a master right. plug in. Like before they had delay comp in Pro Tools, you had to do this whole ridiculous yeah. freaking thing that took. Like, We're a doing whole... a back in my day in the OG. Oh, I don't even know if that's <laughs> back in the day. It's just sorry I, for me. That was a back in the day. You know what no, I mean? Like, yeah, I would put up a, the same instance of the same plugin, but like have it be in bypass or something just to get the the, the, the latency. Oh, right, yeah. From that so plugin. that every channel on yeah. the drum kit had the same plugin on it because otherwise you would end up with weird fit. Yeah, that was that exactly. That was really yeah, fun. that yeah, was good times. Now, Devil Lock, Echo Boy, Decapitator, easy. Sweet. Top three. And why uh, Echo Boy instead of some other delay? I, I don't really need to do much with it. I, I turn the plug-in on and turn the saturation up a little bit, and that's usually, like, you know, that's the sound for me. Ping pong, eighth note, and, you know, a quarter, and that's that's what I need. <laughs> don't really need to do it. You know, I, it took me a while before I even noticed there's that tweak button where when you press the tweak button, there's, like, a whole underneath row of settings, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, fuck. There's like way more <laughs> shit I could do with this thing. It's like it's like finding out your girlfriend speaks Portuguese or totally. something. Totally. You're like, you you're know way I mean? cooler and hotter than I thought you were originally. And I thought you were super hot already. Like, this is amazing. It's a great, it's like, I love that shit. Hidden gems. How about you, Ryan? I know you're, you don't consider yourself like Mr. Engineer, but what are your, three, your favorite sound? Well, it's funny. Like, like, you know, I... I started my film scoring thing right around the time, like, you know, about 12 years ago, right when I moved to Vermont. And when I moved here, you know, Sound Toys is based here. So I met, you know, I met a lot of the people. I met Ken and I got to go run around and see all the gear. And I was like, what's that? You know what I mean? So honestly, I kind of learned what plugins were by just learning what Sound Toys, like what Sound Toys, and literally the first plugins I ever had when I, and I'm a logic guy. Just to speak to my, you know, 
my my Neanderthal sort of thing. It's like I I never learned really on Pro Tools because it it was explained to me by another film composer buddy of mine. I was like, look, this is the shortest between thought and deed. It's just logic. You don't have to do rewire with reason and all this other shit. Like if you have an idea, it's the closest way. It was just the easiest thing for me to learn. So they literally, they're just kind of synonymous with just making music for me. I really like the uh, micro shifter a lot. It just feels like it just helps me with spatial stuff again, because I'm just not, I don't think about a lot of stuff organically. So it just kind of that stuff. I do love the devil lock and I love just like I love blasting the shit out of it and just like compressing the hell out of stuff. And that, that sometimes that angry distortion is really good. And then, you know, and a lot of echo boy, I always use that 15 IPS, like the Bruce Springsteen, like super quick, uh, that little delay. I use it on everything. I use it on whirlies and I use it on voices. I just find like, that's just, it's almost like you, I just kind of throw it up just to kind of give some space to my stuff because I'm not, I know I'm I'm not John Bryan recording with a 13th century zither. You know, it just helps me feel like I'm a little bit more compelling as a as a sonic presenter. Cool stuff. And Dan, you kind of started to hint at this as well, but uh, top three for you. I think the crystallizer. I love it as a synth. Like thinking about feeding it. Um, How do you use it sound as a source? Synth? And- I'm really curious, Dan. Just thinking about it as like not an effect. So if you get just the wet playing with like the detune in it, like on the, when you hit the tweak and you get that fine tune down there or whatever it's called, like playing with that micro tuning there so it's not perfect in and of itself. The way you can blow it out, I guess that's true of almost all the Sound Toys plugins. I love that you can like really just smash the input so it sounds completely different on the output. And then just playing with the ducking, playing with, you know, going back and forth between gate and duck and sending it to something else and then reprocessing it, like recording it and spitting it out. I can get really out of control with the re- recycle and the repeat. And th- I don't know. It's fun to think about it as a, like a textural synthesizer, if that makes any sense. Especially when you feed two into each other and one's pitch shifting up and one's pitch shifting down and they're just like feeding back like crazy. You can get a lot of really weird artifacts. And normally artifacts sound like crap, but I love the way sound toys can destroy a sound. Like you said, abuse a sound. It immediately sounds like its own thing. That's why I like throwing decapitator on something even if it doesn't need any distortion, I want it to be clean. It's nice to have some timbral variation happening. I don't know if it's like placebo effect, but when I throw it on there, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's on there. It sounds good. It's like when someone's like, you know, we ran this through a tape machine. Like, I don't know. Yeah, sure. Sounds great. Um, I, guess, I guess, yeah, a decapitator would be up there. It's hard to, I really love a uh, little plate for the same reason because I can smash it out. But I think Echo Boy and I love Primal Tap. Uh, oh, the vocoder. I love the Sound Toys vocoder. It's my favorite effect, and I can't wait for them to release it and for it to exist. And I can't believe they haven't released it yet. And uh, make a vocoder. <laughs> what is wrong with Sound Toys for not putting out the vocoder that I'm begging them to make? It would be the best vocoder. Anyway, um, yeah, I would say they're delays. And the reason why I would use it over a stock delay or another delay is the the built-in way to smash the input. It feels like a real piece of gear. I learned how to make music by, you know, plugging things into the wrong jack and seeing how it goes. And, you know, I had a, what was it, a PV, PV Rage 258? I think that was the mixer that had um, a line out that when you plugged into it, it didn't mute the speaker. So you could plug the, out, the line out into the input. And it was the best oscillator I've ever had in my life. It sounded so, I mean, it had a little EQ on there, so you could just blast it out in those and like no input mixers, like great way to make a very impractical oscillator. But Sound Toys has a lot of that same level of thinking. Like if you you can destroy a sound putting it in, but you can do a lot to clean it up within the con. Like, oh, on, um, I can't remember the name because I always just drag it in from the list, but their, their dual filter. What's it called? What's their dual filter called? Filter Freak? Filter Freak, yes. The, I love the Filter Freak, especially especially on the crystallizer. Like getting that back in there, if you like run some long feedback through there, you can get some really nice, super soft synthy sounds out of that. And again, I like to, since nothing is finished until like you can't work it anymore, reorchestrating effects and plugins are great, especially when I'm working with an orchestrator. I work with this guy, James Young, and I'll send him some like heavily processed stuff, he'll arrange it for strings, we'll go in the studio, record with the string players, come back, throw the same processing on it, and just sort of 
mess around. I mean, that's the whole point. That's why we got into making music, whether you pick up a laptop or a guitar. It's for some reason, sound is interesting to you. And it can be about, you know, connecting melody or connecting notes or just finding ways for timbres to make sense. So I don't yeah. know. Plugins. All right. Get started uh, on them, kids. Yeah. But, sorry. Never mind. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to not make a joke. <laughs> no one said anything about Alter Boy, but it. we could go on forever. Yeah. The only thing that I hope is when you were screaming about the vocoder, the echo cancellation went out and it went, vocoder, vocoder, vocoder. It was the coolest thing. I really can't let that go without it saying that was like my favorite moment of the, uh, of the interview so far. I can tell we're interviewing a bunch of audio nerds. So uh, <laughs> next chapter I want to see if I could get into here with you guys is just about the, bit of the business side of it. Maybe we'll kind of end on this. Well, first of all, each of you doesn't only work in the field of film scoring, making sound a picture. Each of you are also very active in conventional music production. So starting with you, Ryan, you have a band that you like tour with currently, like to this day. So how do you balance being a guy in a band, writing songs for a band, getting out there on stage, making albums with your dual life as a, a film composer? Um, yeah, I mean, I've sort of lost like all my imposter syndrome somewhere in my forties where I was like, fuck it. I'm going to do everything I want. Like I, I've, I've been doing some writing. I wrote a couple articles for the Atlantic about live music and do a series on dive bars here. And I sold a podcast and you know, all this shit and, and kind of started with film composition. Cause I was like, well, I, I'm just in a band. I don't know how to do this. And once I started to be able to, to actually do that. So I think at this point, like my life, I just kind of think of myself as an artist and I, I have to fill every space or I go nuts. Part of that is I also, my wife made me move to Vermont 12 and a half years ago, once we started having kids. And so I just need create, I just need to make stuff all the time. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it is about slotting things in and hoping that things don't get piled up. And a lot of it is I don't do a lot. Almost everything I do is collaborative. So that's like having a writing partner right now. Like we are working on our last film in the middle of me being on tour. So I'd be like, okay, Jay, can you take care of this while I'm gone? And then when I come back and like, thankfully, like our tour ended in December and this film picked up, right? So sometimes it works out really well, but it's just kind of about managing. Like, it's so fun. It's like, I'm literally just trying to fill every glass at the same time, but also trying to not have them spill over. And it's kind of my work, my life's work is to say, because I have a tendency to just like say yes and want to create more stuff all the time. So it, it's it's just a balance about being kind of a crazy, hyper creative person in terms of like wanting to make shit all the time and finding inspiration everywhere. Like the whole time you're talking, Dan, I'm like, I want to hang out with Dan. I want to make score with Dan. Because I'm just like, like literally like just in the last half hour, I'm just like, oh my God, I want to do something like, you know, like. That's literally how my brain's working. I'm like, well, that guy thinks about shit completely like I don't. So it is a balance. And and the band's great. And, you know, I'm, I have to like, after we hang up, I have to write lyrics because we're going to the studio in like two weeks and I'm, you know, kind of procrastinating. It's really hard. So, but it, it works out really well. And thankfully, all the things that I do kind of all feed each other and I learn a lot and I get a lot of exposure to a lot of really interesting high functioning weirdos, which is kind of my baseline for everything I want in my life is really fucking weird ass people that do shit. So that's like, I think that how, how do the question is, how do I balance it? I just do. And then I, until I don't, and then I adjust. Yeah. So a question here is uh, to be as creative as you are, when you're really in the throes of something creatively, there's a, a sense of things being disorganized or you have to be comfortable in disorganized spaces because you're trying to make something beautiful out of chaos. You know, there's a lot of that in creativity. So are there frameworks of organization that you need in order to stay on track being creative? Or is that why you like collaborating with others so much because they're holding you accountable that you have to show up at a certain time, a certain place with a certain person? Like what are the things that give you some organizational structure so that you get things done that have an end and aren't just, you know, spinning your wheels creatively like so many hyper-creative people can yeah, do. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it, really. And it's just it's just that I need to be held accountable. So that's why every single thing that I do, I never made a solo record. Like, I just, I've been making music for 30, I mean, I've been a band for 30 years, and I do all this stuff. Because it's just, that. it's just me making a solo record. And I love, and I get a lot of inspiration from people. And I love having someone to, like, I love that I have a writing partner now, as a composer, and usually it's with a director, but now I just have someone I'm in the minds with. So yeah, I think 
it is being it is being held accountable to someone and having someone kind of like we're all just like okay you're and it's all different people you know i've got literally again it was like oh i'm working on a broadway thing and sam's texting me he was like did you hear that thing i like i love that when we hang up with this i'm gonna go like work on five different things right now but it's all with five different people or five different sets of people so that is that is where it comes from it is having collaborators and hey jason for you when it comes down to the balance between how you slot in studio time for records versus studio time for film projects and switching back and forth between those two worlds does one have to take precedence over the other is there any trick to balancing those kind of almost dual paths dual careers i mean i think you know ryan sort of said it right it's just sort of like you you kind of just you sort of just do it until it doesn't work and then you know you sort of pick up pick yourself up and do it all over again when it <laughs> when you find you haven't slept for five days in a row it's just sort of you know I'm I'm just really excited to always be in the middle of something and in the middle of a project and in the, in the middle of creativity. So I find myself just sort of constantly pushing myself in that regard. So I, I probably don't need to be as crazy as I am working on a record and working on two films and five TV shows at the same time, like, you know, I am right now, but it's, it's kind of what I, I feel like it builds a certain creative momentum and it kind of one thing feeds off the other. Like, I think if you just work on film scores, you don't, you only sort of get this one side, you know, and you kind of sort of feel like eventually maybe you're getting beat over the head by Hollywood and, and it's all, you know, wrong and bad, but then you do, you take a break and you do a record and it's like, it's awesome. And you feel like rejuvenated and that you want to get back in and, and do another film. And I think being afforded to be able to do that and be creative making records and be able to do film at the same time is pretty great because there are certain guys who who don't bridge those two worlds there there are guys who kind of wish they could do records and have fun just you know doing records and there's guys who go fuck man why won't hollywood call me i want to do a film score and and you know you don't really have to wait for anyone to call you either you could just sort of do it yourself and and just you know write your own film score, make your own movie. And that's, what's kind of great is like, there's a lot at our fingertips to be able to do whatever the hell we want at this point. And I'll just do it till I'm dead at this point. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, <laughs> what's cool too, is that certain clients are doing both themselves for me. So like I have composers that do records and do film scores. And so I just kind of, the schedule works itself out because they're doing it too. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to be doing a film while they're doing the record, because I'm kind of following them, you know. So like I did, you know, like with Nick Urata, his, he has a band called Tabachka, and you know we did a film, and then after that we did a record for three months, and that was all we were doing. So it was that schedule worked itself out. So sometimes it's kind of works, and sometimes it doesn't, and you know you figure it out, I guess. Good stuff. Well, Dan, uh, similar question for you. You kind of originally came to notoriety as a solo artist who made really interesting, distinctive music, a really singular voice and a really amazing live show. And more and more as things have gone on, you've gotten more and more into scoring, but you're still also a solo artist. And I think one of the fears that some people have when they look at the world of film scoring is they're worried, is it going to take away from my art? I do myself as, you know, uh, as an artist or being in a band. And how do you balance those two things? Because you're still active as an artist and does one take away from the other or do they somehow enhance each other? What are your thoughts there? Well, they definitely enhance each other. I don't see how they could take away. I think kind of similar to Ryan and Jason where like everything needs to be filled. I think you can tell by the way I structured my sentences and talks and earlier on in this conversation. <laughs> um, uh, my particular flavor of ADHD is like, if I'm going downstairs to like get a cup and I see like the screwdriver is out, I need to put the screwdriver away. So by the time I, it's like that scene in the end of the jerk where Steve Martin's holding everything. <laughs> so like mixing and writing is like that as well. But early on in my career, I realized that it was two separate entities. There was making albums and there was touring. And I can't be in the studio when I'm on the road and I can't be on the road when I'm in the studio, but I could always be writing when I'm on the road and I could always be thinking about the live show when I'm in the studio. So it's a, that shared brain that like one conversation on top and the other one in the back of your mind. And I been, I've been scoring for a while, but I got really heavy in it during COVID. Luckily I already had the work lined up 
I don't know how on earth I would have done it, scoring three films in a series during an album cycle. So COVID really like couldn't have come at a better time for me. But it's a separate slot in my brain. It's a separate job, if that makes any sense. And in a way, it's what my career needed. I wanted to, I didn't want to be on the road 250 days a year. I don't churn out music for my albums. I don't put out an album a year. Some of them are two to five years apart. There's normally like a pretty big gap in there. And I love writing music. It's my favorite thing to do. And it, I didn't like how it became my economic, my economic status depended on it. Like, is this melody going to hit? Like, is this song going to connect with, like, that sucked. And, but it was a reality. I remember seeing Ian MacKay do an artist talk, talking about the importance of discord and making sure that Ian's music never became their job. And at that point in my career, I'd just become like a middle-class working musician. I was like, what? I thought that was the whole goal. That was the whole dream. And they talked about the destruction of your hobby and how if your hobby becomes your job, it's no longer your hobby. And I wrestled with that for a long, long time. So now film scoring is my job and I love my job. It's a job I love to go to every day. And because I have that separate spot in my brain, when I write music for me, it's completely different because every film is its own project. It's like starting a new band. The, the, like, and I'm coming into it late. Like normally the band's already formed and they're like, we heard that solo you did. Do you want to do that on like, you know, 30 times over 60 minutes once? <laughs> so I go into it like thinking of it as a new musical collaboration, particularly with non-musicians. It's the most fun to make music with people who don't know anything about music because their choices are completely insane and they force you to rethink like what it means or how it is. And they're thinking very like, you know, even for nonfiction, it's all about story and telling story and how you can get story across and how music can be in service of the story. So it's very different from my album. I rarely sit down and I'm like, what is a 45 minute long story we can tell through sound alone? And maybe I should, but it's just different. And I'm finding I, it took a long time to get back into the swing of writing music for myself and to getting back on the road, but I don't want to punish myself for that. And it's, I find it to be fun. Like it's the kind of thing where it's like, I used to be writing music all day and, and then be like, how do I write music again after this for fun? This is ridiculous. My, my ears are fatigued. I've been staring at the screen all day. But now that I write for work and then I write for pleasure, it fills a completely different box. So I think anyone who's out there that's questioning, like, I don't see how, and I learn so much more about music. I have to do so much research for film scores and learn so much more about different genres and different styles. And I work with way more you know, scales and tuning systems or, you know, tonalities than I would for my own music. Like, I think if I put out a record that was all like in like Lydian or Mixolydian, people would be like, what the fuck are you doing? But with a film score, it's like, oh, cool. He's finally not using major chords. Wonderful. So there's, there's a lot of exploration. And if you're, if you're, even if you're just casually passionate about music, I think getting into scoring the picture is a really great way to discover what your essence is. Because I don't know what I, my sound is like. Other people come to me and they're like, oh, we wanted to sound more like Dan Deacon. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. If I knew what that meant, I'd probably stop doing it because I'd be self-conscious about it. So it, I don't know. And some people, the more you do it, like I have people that I work with for film that are like, I didn't know you put out albums and vice versa. Like it's a completely separate world. Like the amount of people who go to Pitchfork and go to IndieWire, the Venn diagram is a real slim sliver. So I wouldn't worry about it, like diluting your audience or anything like that. I think your biggest fans are going to be just passionate to hear anything you put out. And one work is going to inform the other. It's an ecosystem and you are the, the ground of it, if that makes any sense. Beautiful. Well, last question, we'll stick with you for a second, Dan, and we'll, we'll cycle back through is for people who do want to get out of only doing conventional music production and get into the world of scoring for film or for games what would be the most successful path that you could recommend to someone else? What do you think might work for them in landing their first score? Or if they have land their, landed their first score, getting more of them? I think the best way, I live in Baltimore, which is not a, a film capital of the world. And I've lived here for the last 20 years, so I never lived in New York or LA or anything like that. And I'm a big proponent of not moving to large cities. I completely get the reason and the appeal. But for me, I liked being in a smaller community. And I think a great way to get into film composing is to go to the local film festivals around you. Go see as many short blocks as you possibly can. People making short films are making probably proto versions of what they're going to make in feature films, and they're discovering filmmaking through it. I meet a lot of people at film festivals that make shorts that go on to make 
massive, massive films. And it's a great way. And most people have friends who make music, but most people don't have friends who make music to film. So I would familiarize yourself with just, you know, if most early filmmakers don't know how to structure a cue sheet. Cue sheet is a great, great, helpful resource for a composer. Just having, and it's it's kind of like reinventing the wheel. Like the first time, like I came across a cue sheet, like me and another director, like what if we had like a list of like all the pieces of music in the movie and like the times they started and like where they came out. And we're like, this is awesome. And we then on the next project, this. I was like, oh, like, <laughs> exactly. I started the next call. Like I was like interviewing for a job and I was like, let me tell you about the spreadsheet that I like to use. So, um, but there, there's a, a a beauty in that self-discovery, I think. Maybe this is just me. My microphone keeps slouching down. Um, work with people that aren't. If you're going to try to go out there and score a major Hollywood film right off the bat, it's not going to happen unless for some reason you win two lotteries in the same day. Start small. Go to a local festival. You don't need to move to New York, London, or L.A. If you're there, do the exact same thing. See who's making small cinema now and try to see who speaks to you, who's making films that you really liked or that you think your work could elevate and connect with them. Just like the way bands meet. Like sometimes bands are like, how do you book shows? And it's like, you book, oh, how do we get on shows? And you get on shows by booking shows. You see bands from other cities that you like, you ask them to come to your town, you book them, they put you up. That's how a scene in a community grows. Filmmaking is the exact same way. If you like a an editor, you see like, oh, there's this editor in town. Be like, hey, here's my music. Feel free to use it in your temp library. Here are stems. Here's anything. Any re any way that you could get in the mindset of other people making film, try to become a part of that community. And if that community doesn't exist, try to form it. And it doesn't need to be large scale. The The first film I worked on had a you know $20,000 budget and it played all over the world and it really broke both of us out. So, and not the Coppola film. The Coppola film's an outlier. That was an absurd situation. That's like, it, and the first film, like, to, to, to really quickly say it again, the first break I got was scoring for like one of the legends of the game. And then I didn't score another film for 10 years. It didn't like kickstart my career. I also realized I had no idea what I was doing. And it took like, I guess six years. It took six years for me to get back into the mindset of like, okay, this is what I want to do. And I want to learn how to do it. And I did it with an emerging filmmaker who had only made a short. It was their first feature. It was my first feature length film score, in my opinion. And uh, I think that's the way. I'm a big proponent of organic DIY growth. You can shoot to go right into the NBA, or you can start playing basketball for fun. And maybe you'll discover a different path than just like fame and glory. Now, I don't think a lot of people are laying there being like, oh, I'm going to become rich and famous in the lucrative world of film scoring. I think most people are like, oh, I would love to ilk out a little middle-class lifestyle in the <laughs> possibly lucrative world of film scoring. But I get it. There's not like when I, I went to school for composition and when I got out of school, I was like, what a worthless degree. But it's not like there's like orchestras like, where are obscure unknown composers that don't know the nuances of all the instruments? <laughs> so you kind of have to get into film scoring because it's the best way to to get ideas that aren't appropriate for a live show out into the world, in my opinion. So yeah, go to film yeah. festivals. Now, uh, Ryan, a similar question for you. How would you recommend someone go about it today who is looking to get out of just being the band and start working in scores? I mean, Dad stole all my answers I mean, in a lot of ways. I think I think work, finding young filmmakers is, is huge. Like even going to the schools that are like have film departments and just showing up and being like, hey, like, sniffing sniffing butts and seeing like if there's anybody that you vibe with or has a cool haircut it's like oh you, you want to like you seem cool do you want to make some music together and i think that's a huge thing i also just i kind of had my big break when right after i moved to vermont you know i you'd think i'd have to move to i was living in new york city for 10 years and it was when i moved to vermont that i was like oh i've met a, a guy who had a script and He's like, you like my band? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'd like to, I, you want to make a movie? I was like, yeah, I'd love to make a movie. And it was this movie, Safety Not Guaranteed. And the guy was Colin Trevorrow. And now he makes all the Jurassic Worlds and got, you know, and a whole thing. But like, I met him because we lived in Vermont. So I, I, I love the idea. And I think that's, you know, Dan knows you live in Baltimore and Burlington. Like, it's like getting into a cool scene, like being in Athens or, or Asheville or Savannah or like, or some weird, cool little town is almost cooler than being like, I'm going to pack up my things and go to Los Angeles. You know, like I feel, I feel like it's, it's probably really hard to go to UCLA and go in the film composition program because then you're out there. And I think Dan, you probably 
had a very similar experience that I did. And I feel like this is a wave. It's like being in a band helps so much because filmmakers want to hang out with people. Like that's literally how I got my first gig. They do like my band. And so after it's like, and, and now people don't want films that sound like film music. They want it to sound like Dan Deacon. There's no way Coppola was like, Oh, like it's either Tony Shapiro or Dan Deacon. Like, you know, they <laughs> wanted something outside the box. And as film starts to get like, all the rules are being rewritten, you know, with technology and all of this, the more outside you can get kind of the better. And so being, being a like having a, a life and a career that doesn't just, it isn't so like, I'm going to go to film school and I'm going to learn this thing. And I think the more that you can just like be a fucking weirdo in your life and make weird shit and also be a competent communicator and, and, and a hustler and work really hard. That is a, it's a huge thing, but I, I'm a big proponent of not being the guy that goes to school and learns how to do things. Cause I just don't think that's what a lot of true artistry, that's not, they're not going to be drawn to you as a collaborator because that's not what people like cool people generally want. Now, Jason, you come from a much more conventional background in the sense that you're playing in punk bands when you were a teenager, but then you started getting into the studio world as an assistant working on film scores from like moment one and you've just been working further and further forward in your career since then working instead as an assistant as an engineer as a producer as a main mixer on a lot of film scores and you have an assistant to this day in your studio who are trying to take a similar path to what you did and this is a path that used to exist in the music production world that has i don't want to say disappeared but it's not as dominant as it used to be right where the producer was an assistant an intern in a studio or an assistant in a studio then they became an engineer and then they became the producer that path although it still exists in music production maybe doesn't exist to the degree it once did but is it still a really viable path in film is that the path that you think is a good path for someone to take if they are in a major market like LA or New York, or you'd, would you advise something different? I mean, you know, my path wasn't necessarily traditional in, 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 in some ways, you know, I think like, you know, Dan, Dan and Ryan sort of touched upon it, I think in, in, ju in just the right way. It's like, I didn't go to engineering school, you know what I mean? Like I just was like in a band, just knowing that somehow I wanted to end up in a studio because I didn't want to work at thrifties, you know what I mean? Like I just was like, somehow I have to figure this out. And, you know, and I had a friend who was like, dude, I, I'm, I'm, I work at a studio, but I think I'm leaving the job and maybe you'd like to meet the guy. And, you know, I was like, cool and had no idea what that meant. And I went and met this film composer and knew nothing about film music and started working for him or was an intern for the composer and worked my way into becoming an engineer. But this was all by just sort of figuring it out myself and like how, because I didn't, this is what I wanted so badly, but I didn't have the credentials to necessarily back it up. So, you know, I had to work twice as hard or three times as hard as the guy with the Juilliard grad cert who came in going, you know, check me out. You know, I, I, like, like Dan was saying, like, I'm avant-garde and I know everything and, and, you know, hire me. It's like, I didn't know any of that shit, but I built my own home studio when I was 16 and I knew how to wire stuff and, and I knew how to make a record. And I think that like Ryan is saying, it's like, you know, just be weird, do shit meet people, be a social person. And in some way, either a traditional sense of like, okay, I went to film school or I went to recording school and I'd like to intern for you. And, and yes, let's, let's bring you in or that you just meet people and that you end up in, in interesting places where you want to be. You know, we've, we have internships here at the studio. So like everybody who I've hired as an actual assistant, I have, I have four assistants. They were all interns here before you know, I hired them and gave them jobs. And there was a lot of guys who were here that sucked <laughs> and, you know, and, and they left because it was like, you know, they, they didn't have the communication skills. Like Ryan is saying, it's like, you, you can't just be here and, and get yourself in the door. You then also have to be somebody who like, I want to hang out with. Cause if you're weird in a bad way where like, you just strange and don't know how to talk to people or you don't sort of get a scope and sense of like what's going on around you and what people are like and what they're into and you're not interested in other people 
then you're not really going to get very far. You know, you have to be really interested in other people and interested in what they're doing and interested in what they're creating. And it, it isn't about you. It's really never about you. It's about you and everybody else and creating something together with other people. So if you're not that type of person, at least in my eyes, you're not going to get very far, you know, unless you're somebody who's really into it, knows a lot of shit, but also really interested in other people. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I think there's an important distinction. There's two types of weird. There's the good type of weird, which is like being unafraid of being yourself and yes. being unafraid of being interested in the unusual parts of other people. Uh, and then there's a totally different meaning of weird, which is incredibly uncomfortable with both of those things. Well, it's, and that's another way it's, to be weird. Yeah, it's the desire to be interesting uh, yourself rather than interested in other people. You know, you could be weird and fully interested in other people and they want to hang out with you. Or you could be weird and only want to talk about yourself and, and everyone's like, get the fuck out of my studio. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, guys. We really have three very different perspectives and, and approaches on the whole thing. And I think there was something to take out of this for everybody. So big thanks to all of you guys for joining us. Jason LaRocca, Ryan Miller, Dan Deacon. Big thanks also to Sound Toys for helping making this one totally free to the public. If you want to try out some of those fun toys that got mentioned, go over to soundtoys.com where you can try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for hanging out with me here on the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel. See you next time.